Hello, everyone, and welcome to week 29 of MSK Unknown Case Series. We have a radiograph, a sagittal T1 weighted image through the ankle, and a sagittal T2 fat sat MR image through the ankle. This is a patient that has fever, an ulcer along their ankle, and they're concerned for acute osteomyelitis. If we take a look at the radiograph, what we see here is a soft tissue ulcer right here posteriorly, along, posterior to the heel, this area of skin defect. We have this mild resorptive change of the calcaneal tuberosity, and we have focal osteopenia. That's why this bone looks a little darker than the rest of the calcaneus. All suggestive of possibly acute osteomyelitis. On the sagittal T1, we have confluent dark T1 hypointense signal that replaces the normal fatty marrow of the calcaneal tuberosity and the soft tissue ulcer that appears dark. When T1 hypointense signal replaces the normal fatty marrow, that indicates a marrow proliferative or a marrow replacing process. In this case, this is a marrow replacing process because you have cells that normally don't live in the marrow that infiltrate the marrow as does an acute osteomyelitis. And on the sagittal T2 fat set, we have confluent T2 hyperintense bone marrow edema in the calcaneal tuberosity. All these findings are suggestive of acute osteomyelitis. The question I have for you is, which sequence adds more specificity to the diagnosis of acute osteomyelitis? Is it T1, T2 gradient, or T1 fat sat post contrast? And the question is about specificity, not sensitivity, but specificity. We of course know that a T1 adds more specificity because of the replacement of the normal fatty marrow with confluent dark T1 hypointense signal. Had the question been about sensitivity, of course the answer would have been T2 weighted imaging, okay? So acute osteomyelitis reflects infection of the bone marrow. There's three ways or three routes we can get acute osteomyelitis, the direct hematogenous and contiguous spread. Direct is when you have direct inoculation of infection from surgery or hydrogenic injury into the bone directly. Hematogenous is usually inside out. So the infection starts within the bone marrow, then travels to the cortex known as osteitis, then the periosteum known as periostitis, then into the soft tissues where it can result in an abscess or the muscles can be infected resulting in myositis, then of course into the subcutaneous tissues suggesting cellulitis and then possibly to the skin surface. Contiguous spread is the exact opposite. It goes out in. So it starts with a soft tissue ulcer that can result in the subcutaneous tissues resulting in cellulitis, then maybe myositis, maybe a soft tissue abscess, then the periosteum gets infected resulting in periostitis, then the cortex osteitis, and then of course the bone marrow resulting in osteomyelitis. There are common places to get osteomyelitis in the ankle and foot that I want you guys to understand, which some of which is the medial and lateral malleoli in the ankle, the posterior calcaneus or the calcaneal tuberosity, as we saw in this case, the first and fifth metatarsal heads and all the phalanges, right? So the first and fifth metatarsal heads and the phalanges because they're pressure points. And all these areas are very high yield places to get acute osteomyelitis in the ankle and foot. So please, when you have an osteomyelitis case on x-ray, scrutinize these areas very well and look to see if there's radiographic evidence of acute osteomyelitis. Now on radiography, you're looking for cortical irregularity, destruction of the bone, perhaps some periosteal reaction, a soft tissue ulcer, maybe soft tissue gas. These are all signs of radiography of acute osteomyelitis. Now, you should know that radiography can lag behind MRI findings by even up to 14 to 21 days, right? So just because acutely you have a negative X-ray for acute osteomyelitis, it doesn't mean that they don't have acute osteomyelitis. On MRI, you're looking for T1 dark confluent hypointense signal to replace the normal fatty marrow. And on T2, you're looking for bone marrow edema. Of course, we know that T1 is more specific for osteomyelitis. T2 is more sensitive for the diagnosis of acute osteomyelitis. Subacute osteomyelitis, when the acute osteomyelitis flare has you know, gone down, there are certain entities that you should be aware of and buzzwords, quite frankly, for acute osteomyelitis that everyone should have as part of their vocabulary. So a sequestrum is an area of necrotic bone, often dense on radiography, uh, that occurs from in subacute osteomyelitis. The involucrum is that periosteal reaction or granulation tissue that walls off that infection that we can often see on radiography and CT. A cloaca is really just a cortical defect in the bone that occurs and can result in a sinus tract form because what happens is, is that the pus and the inflammatory infectious material exudes out of the bone into the soft tissues and perhaps going all the way to the skin surface forming a sinus tract and that cortical defect is known as a cloaca. And of course, finally, a Brody's abscess is just an intraosseous abscess, and it's an intraosseous infected fluid collection, often occurs in the metaphysis of a long bone. It'll present with T2 bright signal with peripheral 
uh, rim enhancement if you do contrast with that MRI exam. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope that was helpful and tune in next week for another high yield MSK unknown case.